Hello and welcome to today's tutorial. My name is Dr Tiffany Marie Borg and I'll be discussing electrosurgery with you. Electrosurgery is the conversion of electrical energy into clinically usable heat. It is the commonest form of energy that's used in surgery. However, a study in Ireland revealed that 82% of surgeons across all specialties and grades have actually had no formal electrosurgical training. Although 86% of these surgeons felt that electrosurgery is safe, over half admitted that they've had inadequate understanding of the potential risks. And again, over half demonstrated a dangerous lack of awareness of the potential problems that um, can occur when the desired effect is not seen. During this tutorial, we're going to discuss how electrosurgery works, its potential pitfalls, and how best to use electrosurgery to benefit the patient. Over the years, the generators and equipment have evolved to make this technology safer for the patient and more efficient for the surgeon. Electrosurgery uses alternating current. We are familiar with this type of current from the electrical mains, which in the UK is 240 volts with a frequency of 55 hertz. This type of current is potentially lethal if it's passed through the body. At 100,000 cycles per second, 100 kilohertz, electric surge, um, electrocution doesn't occur and the electrical current can pass through the body without any obvious effect. Modern electrical, um, electrical surgical generators rely on this principle. They use frequencies of between 200,000 and 3.3 million cycles per second. This is approximately 20,000 times faster than the domestic mains. As this frequency lies between the domestic radio band, it's frequently also called radio frequency electrosurgery. So when you're using electrosurgery, you have two electrodes, these are placed on a patient and the current passes through the patient's body. The heat generated is usually used to stop bleeding or cut tissue. There are two types of electrosurgery, bipolar and monopolar. In bipolar electrosurgery, the two electrodes are contained within a single instrument, usually forceps. Current is passed only between the instrument tips. Because the amount of tissue is small, the impedance is low and the voltage can be kept to a minimum usually a few hundred volts. The result of this is a local heating effect that's contained within the area being used. This inherently is a safer form of electrosurgery. However, because of instrument design, conventional bipolar is limited to small vessel hemostasis. In monopolar electrosurgery, the two electrodes are separated on the patient's body. One is applied to the patient as an adhesive electrode with a large surface area this is placed over a muscle bulk, distant to the operating site. It's usually known as the pad or the plate electrode. The second is much smaller electrode used by the surgeon during the operation to create the clinical effect. As a result of this arrangement, a larger proportion of the patient is part of the electrical circuit, which is therefore has a greater impedance than the bipolar circuits. The result is higher voltages, usually of several thousand volts. In electric surgical circuits, significant heat is only generated in tissue when the current is passed through a small surface area. This physical phenomenon of high frequency currents is a result of increased energy density. It's important to understand that all parts of an electrosurgical circuit are active and can generate heat. This heat is desired at operation sites, but is unwanted elsewhere along the circuit pathway. Within the circuit, the pad electrode has a large surface area and electrical power across the pad is less than 2.5 watts per square centimetre. This is not enough to cause heat injury when the pad is applied and used correctly. However, the electrode used by the surgeon has a surface area 10,000 times less than the surface area of the pad. As a result, the energy density of the electrode is high and the heat generated is enough to burn the tissue. It's the surgeon's responsibility to control how the heat energy is used. The basics of monopolar electrical, um, electrosurgery allow the surgeon to cut tissue, achieve hemostasis, or in some cases, perform both together. The electrosurgical generator has two sides, controlled by yellow and blue switches. The yellow is concerned with cutting and the blue with coagulation. On the cutting side, there are further switches for pure cut or blended cut. On the coagulation side, there's switches for desiccation, fulguration, or spray. It's important to be familiar with these switches to get the most efficient use from the electrosurgical circuit. In addition, 
Each of these switches comes with a range of power outputs which deliver increasing circuit voltages. The surgeon must be prepared to change the output according to need. To create a cut, you select the pure cut output from the generator. In this setting, the current alternates continuously. Select a high energy density electrode. Press the yellow button before touching the tissue to create an open cut. Within a millimeter of the tissue, sparks are generated. This impacts the surface and causes cellular water to boil, which disrupts the cells and creates a plane of cleavage. By applying tension over the wound across the cut, you prevent the electrode from touching the tissue, which would decrease the cut efficiency. The speed at which the surgeon can cut increases as power is turned up when using finer electrode points. The blended cut technique creates a cut in which small vessels are simultaneously coagulated. Selecting the blended cut switch will change the electrical output from a continuous waveform to an attenuated one, with a short off time between bursts of electrical activity. The first incision will be usually pure cut, with the second incision usually being blend cut. This waveform allows some heating in the wound edge, which results in capillary hemostasis. Contact coagulation is used for controlling small vessel bleeding. The surgeon will select the blue coagulation switch, which in some genera generators may be called desiccation or soft coagulation. The current output is an attenuated waveform, similar to that for the blended output. You select a low energy density electrode. It's important that the electrode is in contact with the vessel to be coagulated before actually turning on the generator. This avoids an open circuit and sparking. The directly applied current gently heats the tissue, desiccating and shriveling it. This achieves hemostasis by coacting of the vessel. If too much power is applied, the tissue will char, stick to the electrode and pull away from the surface without controlling the bleeding. As an alternative to electrosurgical forceps when using a hand switch, the flat of a blade or a ball electrode can be placed over a bleeding point to desiccate it. Fulguration and spray coagulation are used to control bleeding from an oozing capillary bed. Fulguration or spray are selected on the blue side of the generator. The current delivered to the patient is attenuated like the coagulation and blend settings. However, much longer off times are created between energy bursts. It therefore has the highest voltage output delivered by the generator. Any electrode can be used, but a point or blade is the most convenient. After mopping up the area, the surgeon can approach the tissue with the electrode and turn on the generator before reaching the surface. This creates an open circuit. The large sparks produced by this technique are played across the area to be coagulated. Sparks are naturally attracted to blood vessels as the lowest point of impedance is here in the tissue. This technique creates a surface drying effect with little penetration of heat into underlying tissue. You can change the surface area of the electrode using, used at the surgical site. This controls the energy density at the operative site. In general, narrow tipped instruments such as the point or edge of a blade are for cutting and wider tipped instruments such as forceps, a flat of a blade, or a ball electrode is used for hemostasis. In the bipolar technique, bipolar current is delivered from a separate output from the generator and activated by a distinct foot switch. The tips of the forceps should be held across the area to be desiccated and the generator activated. If the tips are pinched closed, the tissue is bypassed and the current will flow through the metal to metal contact in the forceps with minimal tissue effect. Using too much power results in the coagulated tissue sticking to the instrument, which may pull away when the forceps are withdrawn and re-bleeding may occur. We're now going to, going to discuss common pitfalls when performing electrosurgery. The pad electrode is the second electrode in a monopolar circuit. Pad burns remain the largest group of complications from the use of monopolar electrosurgery. It is as active in conducting current as the electrode used by the surgeon, but its surface area is what prevents heating under the adhesive. The effective surface area of a pad can be reduced by changing the conduction of the pad. For example, hair conducts poorly and is able to lift a pad. Therefore, 
The patient should be shaved prior to application. The edge of compression stockings should not cross the pad as this may cause creasing and this changes pad conductivity with the resultant hot spots and possible burns. Similarly, high impedance tissues below the pads such as scars and bony prominences may also create pad hot spots. These should be avoided. In general, a pad should be placed over a well vascularized muscle bulk with the cable placed dependently to prevent the pad from peeling off. Advances in pad and generator technology have ensured that most electrosurgical generators are now equipped to measure the quality of connections and the adhesion between the pad and the skin. When contact is poor and the pad peels off, this is detected by the generator and the electrosurgical current is switched off to protect the patient. The principles of energy density apply at any point along an electrosurgical circuit. Therefore, it is possible to create heating effects at a distant site from the operation where a structure or pedicle narrows. Documented complications of this include burning of a bowel wall during adhesiolysis, penile infarction after a circumcision, cecal fistula from appendix stump coagulation, and common bile duct strictures from overuse of electrosurgery near the cystic duct. Any current will choose to take the path of least resistance and implanted metal will present the lowest impedance path to an electrosurgical current. Therefore, placing a pad electrode on a leg with a hip prosthesis will encourage the circuit to pass through this. As the tip of the prosthesis has a small surface area, this could actually cause heating at this point. Similarly, metal jewellery can conduct stray current and this will result in contact burns, especially between digits or to the leg. Therefore, it should be taped or removed to avoid this. Similarly, body piercings in the current path should also be removed. Electrosurgical circuits emit magnetic fields which can induce current flow in an adjacent conductor. This is known as the capacitance effect. This electromagnetic radiation can excite the neon in a fluorescent light tube placed close to the electrosurgical cables. Unwanted capacitance can be generated by wrapping cables around a metal towel clip to secure them. If the drape is breached, and skin contact is made, this can generate a small burn. Cables are therefore best secured in tunnels in the drapes, and the electrode should be stored in a non-conducting holder. Capacitance can be induced in a metal cannula during laparoscopic electrosurgery. This will usually dissipate harmlessly through contact with the abdominal bowel wall, but in open circuits with vulgaration or spray currents at high voltage settings, it does have the potential to burn bowel. For this reason, a metal cannula should not be isolated with a plastic retaining screw, but should remain in contact with the abdominal wall. It is best practice to keep power settings low and avoid high voltage outputs. Glove burns are a specific example of capacitance burns. On the whole, a latex glove does not conduct electricity. However, an electrosurgical circuit will flow across the glove capacitance will flow across the glove by capacitance with ease. High voltages are generated if the operator turns on the coagulation current before touching the assistant's forceps or if the assistant removes the forceps from the tissue before the power is turned off. In both cases, current can flow through the assistant and this can be enough to melt a small hole in the glove and cause a burn. Implanted cardiac devices present specific issues with the interaction between electrosurgical current and the implant. Pacemakers are a metal implant and are subject to some problems of current channeling as uh, the same as uh, if you were using a metal hip prosthesis. In this case, the point of highest current density is where the wire con contacts the endocardium. Heating at this point may increase the resistance of the endocardium to the pacing current. This may as a result prevent stimulation of the heart. In addition, electromagnetic radiation from electrosurgery may interfere with the pacemaker or electronics. The risk of pacemaker failure is reduced with the use of bipolar instead of monopolar electrosurgery. In situ defibrillators can also interpret the diathermy currents as BF and potentially lead to shocking the patient. These devices need to be deactivated prior to surgery. Lastly, Operating theatre fires are fortunately rare. To start a fire, you need three things, oxygen, fuel, and an ignition source. 
In the operating theatre, the oxygen is delivered by the anaesthetist and fuel sources can be found in drapes or flammable alcoholic skin preparations. These preparations can pool around the patient after application. Therefore, it's essential that you allow time for complete evaporation before laying down drapes. Electrosurgery is a potent ignition source. That concludes today's tutorial. If you have any further questions, do not hesitate to message us. For further information regarding this topic, visit teachmesurgery.com. Alternatively, the Royal College of Surgeons have an excellent course, the Basic Surgical Skills course, where they discuss this topic in further details. We hope you found today's tutorial useful and look forward to seeing you at our next session. Take care and have a great day.